So I'll be talking to you today about my work towards uh, solving unsteady problems in aerodynamics using an adaptive space-time scheme and uh, specifically a discontinuous Galerkin finite element method. Um, this work is actually really preliminary in nature right now, so actually what I'm talk gonna be ta showing you is more of a proof of concept. Uh, the work exists as part of Project X, which is a CFD software package directed by Professor David Darmafal. To date, we've mostly been interested in solving steady problems, but you know what they say about CFD people, as soon as you can solve steady problems, they wanna solve unsteady problems, which is good because all the interesting stuff in aerodynamics is unsteady. Um, like there's a number of you know, fascinating applications out there, but current methods really lack um, the ability to, to run automatic error control, and they generally don't use their degrees of freedoms very efficiently. Um, the reason I believe that um, working in space-time, which is substantially more complicated and expensive than, um, or you might think it's more complicated and expensive than uh, traditional methods, but I believe it could, has the potential to be more effective because uh, a lot of unsteady problems are actually really anisotropic in the space-time direction. And like one simple example of that is if you imagine a wave propagating forward in time and the diameter of the wave is very small compared to the propagation distance, then I don't need a whole lot of resolution along the travel path. Um, we've already recognized that having the appropriate mesh anisotropy in non-space-time problems can lead to like massive efficiency gains, and we wanna try and apply this to the space-time setting. Uh, this has already been recognized as a valuable component of space-time techniques, as indicated by this quote here, which I'm not gonna take the time to read. Um, like, but one limitation of the work that Law and Fitkowski did is that they were actually using quadrilateral meshes, which cannot produce very much mesh anisotropy. But uh, simplex meshes, on the other hand, can, and I'll attempt to demonstrate very simply why this is the case. So let's consider a really, really simple 1D problem. Um, it's a stationary shock. Ideally, you'd expect a mesh that looks like this, just two elements. Shock tracking is not a realistic thing, so I drew a more realistic mesh of five elements. Um, if the shock is now moving to the right, the ideal mesh in space-time might look like this with only three elements. But if you're using a traditional like method of lines type of approach, then the number of degrees of freedom that you have in space-time is actually a whole bunch. Um, because you have to take that initial spatial mesh and basically just copy it straight up a whole bunch of times. And I'll say this mesh has n uni elements in it. Um, this current state of the art in space-time adaptation and also like AMR type methods might produce a mesh that looks something like this. It's an ad you know, adapted quadrilateral mesh. It's a, you can see that it has a hierarchical type of structure and the elements are all tensor product in, sh in type. And the number of elements here is on the order of the square root of n uniform. So we've lost a factor of the square root of n uni, but we can do better. Um, if we were to use simplex elements, then in the best case scenario, what we might be able to achieve is to have the total number of elements in space time be only a constant factor larger than the number of elements in 1D. So this might allow us to solve like, you know, potentially large, complex, unsteady problems using only a little bit more effort than we have to, would have to apply to compute a steady solution. And you know, this result here is basically that the um, dimension of the problem is reduced. So I'll come back to some more concrete examples of this, but I hope this kind of motivates, uh, at least gives you a high-level high idea of what I'm trying to do. Um, the idea of using space, or working in a space-time domain is not new. Um, in 1989, Bar Yosef was the first to apply DG to such a scheme. Um, Hartman in 2001 and 2002 did some DWR-driven isotropic mesh adaptation. And in 2011-2012, Law and Fitkowski applied anisotropy measures and also linear solver improvements to make the method uh, more efficient. But the downside, again, of that was that they were restricted to quadrilateral meshes, which don't achieve high levels of anisotropy. Um, so kind of the, uh, my goal here would be to develop an autonomous, robust, and practical solution strategy for certain unsteady problems using a space-time DG method. And sort of like the high-level technologies I'll be employing are um, a higher-order DG scheme, DWR-based error estimation, which I'll discuss, um, a mesh optimization-based adaptation strategy, and metric-based meshing. Um, the whole idea of the 
discontinuous scalar and finite element scheme is where we want to represent high order solutions over a bunch of elements that divide up our domain. And on each element, we have a pth order polynomial representing the solution. And we allow the solution to be discontinuous between elements. And what this gives us is a nearest neighbor stencil, which is nice for implementation and parallelism. Uh, we'll also be working with simplex or you know, the triangular and tetrahedral elements because they can mesh complex geometries and obtain arbitrary levels of anisotropy. And we'll be driving the whole process with uh, output-based adaptation. And so we'll be looking to estimate the error in integrated outputs of interest, like lift or drag, which are very relevant to aerodynamic interests, and then localize those error estimators to individual elements so that we can then decide which elements need to be refined. Um, kind of like the high level outline of the problem we're solving here is we want to be able to compute some output J of u like lift where u satisfies the governing equations like Navier-Stokes equations. Um, you can, can't do this in general, so we're left with being able to compute a discrete output J of you know, sub HP with a discrete solution u. And we want to be able to estimate the amount of error in our discrete uh, output. But supposing that we can do that, then we could imagine being able to compute the flow solution, estimate the error, and adapt the mesh to control that error and repeat until we've met our tolerance. And it turns out the technology to do all those things exists. Um, the error estimation is through a method called dual, re dual weighted residuals, which was due to Becker and Ranneker in 2001. Uh, it uses a quantity called a dual solution phi, which you can think of as a transfer function between perturbations to the residual and the output of interest. And these residual perturbations you would think of as being truncation errors, so the difference between the discrete peak solution and the continuous solution. And then what the um, DWR method tells us is that in order to minimize output error, we need to control for um, the errors in the primal solution and errors in the dual solution. But so this R of HP UV term here is a weighted, you can think of it as a weighted inner product between the primal and the dual. And so, in, um, so you need to resolve both, uh, both primal and dual, but in places where the dual is resolved very accurately, it doesn't really matter how well or poorly you resolve the primal, because if the error is zero in one place, the error could be like 10 billion in the other place, and you still product out to zero. So what that means is that, you know, while using this scheme forces me to resolve both primal and dual features, it also means it, that there are large swaths of dual solution and large swaths of primal solution that I can completely ignore. Um, the uh, mesh adaptation strategy we're using is called MOSE, which was developed by somebody at else at MIT, at, uh, Masayuki Yano in 2012. The method is driven by that DWR error estimator from the previous page. And it results in, um, uh, sorry, the method resolves both primal and dual solution features. It doesn't make any assumptions about how the solution is, how well behaved the solution is. And it's very robust in so far as we'd be able to start from like any kind of arbitrarily poor initial mesh and be able to converge to the right answer. And the way the method works is it actually computes, it attempts to compute the optimal mesh that minimizes the amount of error for a given number of degrees of freedom. So if I tell you that I want to solve this problem with 100,000 elements, then we will be able to produce the mesh that does so with as little error as possible. And at a high level, how the algorithm works is that you, you look at each element and you imagine cutting it up in different ways and like evaluating how much error results when you cut up the, those elements in each of these ways. And then you can, um, that gives you some information on how the error responds to changes in the mesh, which you can then use to solve this optimization problem. So, um, so Yano showed, uh, had some preliminary investigation of space-time adaptation to demonstrate the uh, versatility of his adaptation algorithm, which I will now show as further motivation for why space-time could be a very effective method. Um, in this case, we're solving a 1D space plus one, dim uh, one temporal dimension, so it's a 2D problem. Uh, it's the Euler equations, and we're exciting the entropy mode. So it's a simple Gaussian perturbation, and the output of interest is just like the entropy perturbation at the final time. And 
On the right here is a convergence study between the adapted in the solid line and a uniform refinement in the dotted line. And you can see that the number of degrees of freedom saved is pretty substantial. And it's also even more clear from the mesh because in the time direction, the number of elements that span this thing is only about three. So it means we're getting nearly perfect anisotropy. Right, and what that means from the earlier slides is that we've reduced the dimension of this problem. Um, we can consider a slightly more complicated problem in 2D plus one. So it's still the Euler equations, and now we're looking at um, two spatial dimensions plus one temporal, uh, exciting the shear mode. And you know, if you look at the meshes, you can see a high degree of anisotropy. And if you look at the convergence history, there's, we have another way here of evaluating uh, why space time can be if, uh, can add a lot of efficiency. And that is, um, if you look at the expected convergence rate for a DG method, it's h to the 2p. Uh, in 2D, this correlates to the number of degrees of freedom raised to the pth power. And in 3D, it's the number of degrees of freedom raised to the 2p over 3. In the uniformly refined cases, right, this was a genuine 3D problem. So these uniformly refined cases achieve uh, convergence rates that are commensurate with the 3D result. But with the adapted results actually super converge and they achieve the 2D rates even though we're solving a 3D problem. And the only conclusion you can draw from that is that the dimensionality is again reduced. Right, so the whole idea here is that for certain kinds of problems where you know, we have these wave like narrow wave propagation type structures, um, with the right adaptation scheme that can introduce the correct amount of anisotropy, we can achieve much higher levels of much higher rates of convergence and much less error per degree of freedom. Yeah, much less error per degree of freedom than more traditional type methods. And you know, and this is again ongoing work and kind of like the, the downsides of space time methods is that they're really quite expensive compared to just spatial problems because you end up having to store a lot more information and that's some of the things I'm trying to address right now. Like for example, uh, if I were to s store the 3D Jacobian matrix for P equals two solution at 10 million elements, that would require 40 terabytes of memory. The P equals three would require 219 terabytes, which is just you know, unreasonably large. And there's a number of things you can do to try and reduce these things down, like introducing a time slab type structure, which would make the Jacobian matrix upper block triangular. Um, and on top of that, we'll also need a, a whole slew of new um, linear solver techniques that will reduce the cost of that phase of the problem in order to make this whole scheme like even reasonably practical. Um, and our solver at the moment also has substantial robustness problems um, when there are strong shocks, which is quite bad for us, but something else I need to work on. But ultimately, you know, if I can address both of these issues, then I'll be able to hopefully be able to demonstrate the practicality of this method on complex 2D plus one or 3D plus one problems, you know, like rotor stator flows or any, any number of other, uh, other interesting aerodynamics applications. All right, so that concludes my talk. And I'd like to thank you know, my friends and my advisor, the whole Project X team, and last but not least, uh, the Krell Institute, CSGF, and the Department of Energy.